We greet you this morning. We rise up, Lord, and we look upon the work that you've been doing while we've been sleeping. Scripture says that he who watches over Israel does not sleep. So while our eyes were shut, while we were dreaming, God, you were working in the world, in our spirits. So, Lord, we rise this morning to join with your work that you've already been doing. And God, I just pray that you would allow us to see, allow us a glimpse in to your activities this day. That we may take part in it with you. And we thank you for your faithfulness and your awesomeness. You are a faithful God. You are a faithful God. Faithful God, faithful God, yes, you are a faithful God. You are a faithful God. You are a faithful God. Faithful God, faithful God, yes, you are a faithful God. You are faithful, faithful, faithful God, faithful God, yes, you are a faithful God. Faithful God, faithful God, yes, you are a faithful God. And faithful God, faithful God, yes, 
your house, but it is one day in your courts and thousands elsewhere, and a thousands elsewhere. Señor, un cántico nuevo cantar al Señor, un cántico nuevo cantar al Señor, un cántico nuevo cantar al Señor, cantar al Señor, y que hizo él, hizo maravillas y que hizo él, hizo maravillas y que hizo él, hizo maravillas cantar al Señor, cantar al Señor, el mar vivió, pasaron en seco el mar vivió, pasaron en seco el mar vivió, pasaron en seco cantar al Señor, cantar al Señor. One more in you. Well, should we take a little higher? Cantar al Señor, un cántico nuevo, cantar al Señor, un cántico nuevo, cantar al Señor, un cántico nuevo, cantar al Señor, cantar al Señor, y que hizo Así que hizo él, hizo maravillas y que hizo él, hizo maravillas cantar al Señor, cantar al Señor, el mar vivió, pasaron en seco el mar vivió, pasaron en seco el mar vivió. Pasaron el seco, cantar al Señor, cantar al Señor. Amen. Not bad. And in the morning when I rise In the morning when I rise In the morning when I rise Give me Jesus Give me Jesus Give me Jesus, you can have all this world, but give me Jesus. And when I am alone, and when I am alone And when I am alone Give me Jesus Give me Jesus Give me Jesus can have all this world, but give me Jesus. And when I come to die, 
And when I come to die And when I come to die Give me Jesus Give me Jesus Give me Jesus You can have all this world But give me Jesus Give me Jesus Give me Jesus You can have all this world You can have all this world You can have all this world But give me Jesus Just more of you, Lord More of you, Lord And less of me Savior say thy strength indeed is small child of weakness watch and pray find in me thine all in all Jesus paid it all all to him I owe sin had left a crimson stain he washed it white as snow. Lord, now indeed I find thy power in thine alone can change a leper spots and melt the heart of stone and Jesus paid it all all to him I owe sin had left a crimson stain he washed he white as snow and that's good news that's good news, yeah. And when before the throne I stand in him complete, Jesus died my soul to save. My lips shall still repeat. Sing Jesus. Jesus made all sin. Sin had left a crimson stain. He was. He washed it white as snow. He washed. He washed it white as snow. Oh, he washed it white as snow. So praise the one who paid my debt and raised his life up from the dead. So praise the one. 
one who paid my debt and raised his life up from the dead. So praise the one who paid my debt and raised his life up from the dead. So praise the one who paid my debt and raised his life up from the Jesus paid it all. I wonder if we should just call on the names of, of God right now. Just, to, uh, just these final few minutes that we have left. Just call on his name. Praise him with just telling him who he is. Lamb of God. Receive the praise of your people this morning, God. You are all of these things, spoken and unspoken, God. And eternally more than anything we could ever name or offer or give to you. And God, we stand humbled and in awe in your presence. But comfortable and safe through the blood of Jesus. God, we stand in the Holy of Holies before you as children and friends. And we are thankful, God. And we call on your name. We call on your power to stay with us in, these, in this last day of this conference, God, and teach us. God, may we get a revelation today, God, something new that we haven't seen. And God, may we take a piece of what we felt and what we've learned back to our neighborhoods and back to our homes. We love you, God, and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you guys go ahead and have a seat? Jesus paid it all. Jesus paid it all. I, I want to say that. I want to, all to him I owe. I want to say that. I want to say that. For me, he paid it for me. He redeemed me. He forgave me my sin. He called me into a, a ministry to serve him. The motivation for our mission ought to be gratitude. I, I don't think we understand that. I don't think we understand that. I, I think we, we work out of our guilt. We work out of our guilt. We ought to get this guilt when we are coming to know him yeah. we ought to feel an overpowerment of guilt because we are guilty we are sinners but he his blood washes away all of our guilty stain 
And the rest of our life ought to be lived in gratitude to this holy and forgiving God. The forgiven grace of God is all what it's about. If you don't understand that, you don't understand redemption in our life. Forgiven, they shall call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sin. I'm doing something this morning that I, I, understand, I understand now uh, the book of Jude. I've, 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 the book of Jude, that's not what I want to study this morning. Uh, but I'm, uh, the book of Jude is, um, is one of my favorite books. Uh, it seemed like that Jude had in mind when he was writing, going to write this book to the believers and to the church. He had in his mind that 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 he was going to write about the. I think Jude was going to write another gospel, and we would have had a a fifth gospel from Jude. I think Jude intended to write because they were writing these gospels, and but as he sat down to write this gospel I think to his to the church he fell overpowered by the Holy Spirit because the church was in its beginning and antichrist they called it that was heresy had set in and, and was, was, was about to engulf the church with what people who didn't know Christ was saying about Christ. And he fell overpowered. And so the Holy Spirit said, he said, I intended to write about the common faith that was once delivered unto the, once and for all delivered unto the saints. That's a very important statement. The truth about Jesus Christ is encamped in the Jesus life himself and the apostles. An apostle. Not what somebody else said. But the life of Jesus, those eyewitnesses, and those ones who were with the eyewitnesses. And that we're supposed to be living on the teaching of the apostles' teaching and the prophets. Not on what somebody else said about what somebody else said about God. We're supposed to be witness to, the, to, to that. Jude began to see, that's what John wrote about. John wrote about the fact, the fact that heresy and antichrist were at work. They were saying things about God that, Je that Jesus didn't say when he was on earth. And they began to live by that. They began to live by folklore. And what somebody else said, somebody else said about God. And they were moving themselves away from the teaching of the apostles and the prophets. John said that. See, there's a certain amount of heresy the church has always had in it. But when heresy eat up the foundation, then you're in trouble. And the foundation of the church is that Christ came into the world to reconcile people back to himself and to each other and to make a new humanity on earth. A new humanity of loving people loved each other. And when we allow racism and bigotry to come in, it disgraces and undermines the basic truth because that's the basic truth. And our church in America has been living with that heresy, but now it is about to engulf it. It's about to engulf the church in our society. And so I had this feeling last night. I had this feeling last night that I, I was going to, I've got the best out of Habakkuk. But I felt overpowered to write to you, to talk to you, as Jude said, to write to you about how we should content for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. And so this morning, what I want to talk to you about is the call and the will of God. The call, that's, those are very important. All of us, I'm taking it here, that most of us here are believers. I'm taking that, that you would come here. But I'm hearing funny stuff about the call of God I'm hearing funny stuff about the will of God, and I'm hearing that we almost unturned the will of God into what it is we want to do in society, and we're sort of sanctifying what we want to do. 
And instead of us doing God's will, I'm feeling that we are doing our own will. We're doing our own thing. And that we are feeling called to do our own thing, and we are naming that God. And that can happen in an organization like ours because we are people of ministry. We want a ministry. We want people to minister. But we don't want to be carrying out people's own ego. The will of God is everything. Finding the will of God should be our every concern. And I'm, 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 I'm nervous when I hear people who have found it too quickly. Too quickly. The will of God should be some meditation. It should be some preparation. It should be some listening. Listening to God. To know his will. To know his will. And then to be guided by his Holy Spirit into his will. And so this morning, what I thought I would talk about this morning is the call and the will of God. And I'm going to go to a passage that is as clear on that as we can find. It's an Old Testament passage. It is in Isaiah chapter 6. So if you have your Bibles this morning, open them to Isaiah chapter 6. And we're going to talk about the call and the will of God. What I want to do here, we want to get this from the scripture. We don't want to get this from our own imagination. We want to go back to the Word of God. I really believe that the Bible is the inspired Word of God. I, mean, I believe that it's living, it's powerful, it's sharper than any two of your sword, it pierces to the dividing of center of soul and spirit and joints and mars, and the discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Well, you know, where, 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 where Islam got us at, they live by the Quran. We are beginning to live by folklore. We, we are making the Bible say what it is we want it to say. We're deciding on what it is we want to do, and then we get some scriptures, proof texts, to drive us towards what we want to do. And in that way, you can make the Bible say almost anything if you take it out of context. We need to know the basic foundation of truths if we're going to live by the word of God. The Bible is a practical book for living. The Bible is more than an inspiration of book. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the people of God may be thoroughly furnished unto all good work. And so we have to honor our steps. That's what we want to see CCDA to be. We want to be people who was attempting to live out the word of God. Uh, we feel that God has spoken to us. He's spoken, and he's spoken, and these apostles hear it, and they put it into the word. That's what the Hebrew tries to say here. God, who is son of time and in divers manners, spoken time past unto the fathers by the prophet. But in these last days has spoken to us by his son. And those apostles walked with him. And then they communicated what he wanted us to know and how he wanted us to live down here on earth. And so we got to go back to the foundation. And that's the word of God. And then try to order our steps by that word. And so let's listen to the call and the will of God. Uh, I believe that God is calling people in this place here. And I believe there are people in this group here who wants to do the will of God. And what we want to do is to help you and to encourage you and to be involved with you and to do whatever we can do to push you on into that will that God has called you to do. That's what we are here for. And so let's listen at this call of God, and then I'm going to uh, try to give this good explanation of God's call upon our, upon our life. It's found in Isaiah chapter 6. This is clear calling here. Isaiah chapter 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord. Now, this is somewhat of, of a description here of when this man was called. But this is not right now the call. He's describing the vision. 
that he got. And, and we know that all the way God called people, he gives them vision. And as Bill Hyber said, we, we turn that vision into passion. And with that passion, we follow God. With a passion. Passion. And so he's describing here now first the vision. And then he gonna get, we're going to get into the call. We're going to look at the call. And this call needs to be in connection to something that God won't done. And that's the will of God. You, you get the idea, something that God wants you to accomplish. That's his will for your life. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord. Sitting up on a throne, high and lifted up, and his glory filled the temple. Above it stood these seraphims, these angelic beings. Each one having six wings. And with two wings he covered his face. And with two wings he covered his uh, feet. And with two wings he did fly. And one of these beings was crying one to another. Saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the doors moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal who he had taken with his tongues from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this has touched thy lips. Thou sin, thy iniquity is forgiven, and thy sin is purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, here am I, dear Lord, send me. And the Lord said, go. And tell this people, hear you indeed, but understand not. See you indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat. And make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart and be converted. Let's talk about this. This is a clear, and I'm going to come back and do the text here, but this is a clear, the clearest call that we have. It is, it is, it is even clearer than Paul's Damascus Road experience, which was a very powerful uh, call. Paul has to add on and on that vision as he go along, you know, in that vision when he was on the Damascus Road, uh, uh, he didn't hear the totality of the call. He didn't hear all of this that he had called him to send him far away to the Gentiles, to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to the power of God. It was indicated in that first one. So you didn't hear. But here you have a very clear calling what God is calling this young man. We got an understanding. What is the, what is the will of God? The will of God. It's what God has revealed in His Word, and what He has revealed in His call to you. Um, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, that you present your bodies as a holy sacrifice holy and accepted unto God so that you can understand and know what is that perfect will of God. And so the will of God is, 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 is God's call upon your life. And, and God calls us for life. 
God calls us to come and die with him. That's why I know this up and down, bouncing around. Uh, God, calls, God is an eternal God, God. And when God calls, he calls you to come and die with me. He calls us to say, come, be thou faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. God calls us in relationship to the gift of the enablement he gives to us, and he wants us to use that the rest of our lives. Rest of our life. Some people are using the calling as a negative force not to do things. You, you, you know. Uh, I'll say to somebody, this lady has just had both her legs amputated, and let's get together on a Saturday morning, guys, and let's go down and let's build a ramp for this lady. This old lady, she lives by herself, and she got to get in the house. Let's go down and build a ramp for her. And somebody said, that ain't my calling. Uh, that ain't my gift. You, you, you understand? God's calling is that he, people would rescue the perishing and care for the dying. God's calling is that we might reach out to the most vulnerable people in the world. God's calling is to go to the prison and give clothes to the naked. God's calling is for us to be involved in doing his will here on earth. And he tells us in Matthew chapter 25, he tells us that how we do the will of God. As much as you are doing it for the least of these, my disciples, you are doing it for me. And so some people use that. Hey, my gift. Hey, my gift. I like, I like Miller Fuller this time. He wrote a book called The Theology of the Hammer. He, he said that people need housing. People need housing, and God had called him to build houses for people. And he was recruiting those people who understood that hammer theology. Coming down. Everybody didn't have to do that, but he was calling those out who really wanted to do that. And so we understand a little bit of the of will of God. But let's go back now to the, to the call of God here in our passage here. And that's what I want to give my attention to here this morning. Um, let me give you the little setting of the time so you can understand it. It was a very difficult time uh, in, in, well, it was a very crisis time. It wasn't, a, it wasn't crisis in the sense that, that there was poverty and all of that stuff because they had had one of the great kings. Uh, this king, Uzziah, had been one of the great, great kings in the Bible. He was an inventor. He was an agriculturist. He had made the nation so very, very prosperous. And he was so loved by the people. But you have to be careful when you become so prosperous. Because one of the things that will get you, you'll get lifted up in pride. And, and God resists the pride. God, God goes against the proud. I mean, it, it ain't just normal. God resists the proud. When God gives what is the most wicked thing people can do, one of those is a prideful look. A pride. God resists the proud in our society. And what happened to him because he had been so successful and been such a great king and he provided so much and he was sort of had his hand in everything and then he really wanted then to have his hand in the worship service in a way that God said only the Levites and the priests can do that. And so one day he went in with all of his pride to worship. And instead of him taking his seat where he was supposed to take it, he decided he would go into the, go in there, and he himself would offer the evening sacrifice. That he would take the, all of the equipment and do it himself. And the priests, and them, they come to him, and they ran to him and say, King, don't do that, don't do that. You, 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 you are going against God. You are going against the will of God. That God has reserved this for us to do, and you have to worship this wonderful God. But he kept going. He broke out of the hand and went up that way and picked up the, the tongue and was going to make the offering. And God struck him with leprosy. Now, you know the next morning in the paper, they didn't say that God struck the king with leprosy. What was in the paper that next morning is that the king had a stroke. <laughs> that the king had a stroke, and we had to rush the king out of the, out of the place. God struck him, struck him. And for 15 years or so, he was on his bed afflicted. 
he put his son on the throne, you know, and the son reigned. And because he had been so good, prosperity was still going. The word the nation was still going greatly. But then the news came one day that the great king was dead. It was a little bit like when John Kennedy was killed. It was a little bit like that. Yeah, I don't know where y'all remember where you was at. That's been a long time ago. Uh, we had elected this young, vibrant president. First time we'd ever seen any children in the White House and all of that. And they was playing around the White House. They had turned their White House into a park, a playground. And they were using it where it's supposed to be used. And, and so it was one of them. They elected him. And the first thing he said in his inauguration speech, he was trying to get rid of He was trying to mobilize the best in us. He wanted to move us beyond welfare. He, he wanted to affirm our dignity. He said in his inauguration speech, ask not what America can do for you, but ask what you can do for America. He challenged us. He, he, he challenged us. Russia had beat us to space. The spookness had gone up. And when he was elected president, he said, uh, in 10 years, we'll have a man on the moon. And in 10 years, we had a man on the moon. He challenged us to our best in our society. And so the king is dead. The great king is dead. And, and, and so the, everybody's going to the temple. I'm sure in the, in the temple they had a, a, a big black scarf covering where the, where the king was set and probably a, a David star in the, in the front in, in black, but it was sad. They went into the temple to pray. This young man, Isaiah, was probably about 14 or 15 years old. Now, you know he was a nephew probably of the king. You know how that worked? Because he was a, he was a, he was a strive, he was trained to be a secretary uh, and to keep the records because the Jewish people kept good records of everything. And so he was being trained to do that. And he went in sadly to the temple. He was weeping like everybody else was weeping. And it was in this temple he got this vision from God. He got this call of God. You get that there? He got this call of God. You know, I, you know, another thing, too, when God called people to do certain things for him, then he gifts them in relationship to that calling. You know, out there in the wilderness, those Jews out there had been slaves in, in Egypt uh, for, for, all the, for all this time. But when God called them out into the wilderness and put them in that wilderness out there, he gave them gifts and skills that the Jewish community still have. He taught them how to work in gold. They go to a jewelry store. He taught them how to work in fine clothing. If you want some good clothing, you go to a Jewish store. You know, God gifted those people who didn't have those gifts because he wanted them to do the tabernacle. He gave them the gifts. If you read it, he, he poured those gifts upon them because he had a task for them to do. So God calls and then God gifts us in relationship to that call. That, he know us, you see. He know our makeup. He know our capability. And then he calls us, and he calls, and he calls by his own will. By his own sovereign will to do that. And so he, he calls here. I don't know if I can see now that having to turn the light, I having to turn the light, I having to turn the lights off. I turn the lights off. Yeah, that's, that's better. Uh, uh, okay. And so he's in, he's in, he's in, the, he's in the um, temple there. And let's listen, at the, let's listen at the call here. He said it was in the year that King Isaiah died, I saw also the Lord. He said that I saw also the Lord because he's going to get many other visions. But he's talking now about the original vision. He got, he got many of them, so he's protecting himself. He didn't, the calling, he didn't see the Lord. He didn't get just one calling in terms of one vision. He got many visions, and he writes these visions down in, in the scriptures. So I, I saw also the Lord. He was sitting up on a throne. He was high and lifted up.
and his glory fill the temple. Above him, all of these surfing these beings, and they are saying, holy, holy, holy. And the posts of the doors of this big temple, these big poles, they moved at the voice of him that cried, and this house was filled with his glory. What is the first thing happened here when you got the call of God? And I think it's I think we have a call here that is that 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 is consistent in the call of God. If you read the, if you read the uh, prophets, you're going to find a, a consistency in the way God calls people. So this is very important that you listen to God's call here. What is he doing here in this first one? What do we see here? We see that God is not a Proroco God. God is not just a Baptist God. God is not just a Presbyterian God. We see the God of the universe and his glory fills the earth. Don't put God in your box and tack it up and think that God only functions in your box. We got to see God. Your outer God is too small. When you see God, you meet a big God. You meet the God of the universe. That's important. If you walk around losing all of your time trying to limit God to your box. Well, if we can get the idea, we can make some cities go. What I'm seeing that cities are working in that is there are some usually, this is sort of consistent. Is there are some sort of businessman, and I call him a sort of an ecclesiastical guy, who decides that all he want to do is to organize the people in that town to do the will of God. When we find that kind of town, kind of person, you usually going to see things going forward. Because of another preacher doing it, they think he's doing it for his own church. And, somebody to, you know, and, and so the competition is so great. But you just see some successful businessman who says, now God has called me to do this. And I see that in cities around the country. Cities around the country. And everywhere I'm going, I'm looking for those kind of people. Looking for those kind of people so they can hear the call of God, so they can organize us together and not be in such competition in society. Oh, I see it in pastors sometimes. Up in Oregon, I saw a pastor that guy. He was the most successful pastor in the, in the city. And he felt this call of God that it wasn't good enough that his church would be successful, but that all the churches in town would be successful. And he said, why don't we call ourselves one church, one church in this city, and many congregations, and why don't we all work together? And when somebody get tired over here with me, and go over to you, and you give them the same thing, and go to another, they can't do church. If they do church hopping, they're going to hear the same thing. Let's become brothers and sisters in the body of Christ, and let's try to disciple these people in the word of God. So we need, we need that. We need that oneness in a city. Oneness in a city. The Jewish people had a synagogue every three quarters of a mile in the city. And, and, and the churches in the city was, was, was there for the community, for the neighborhood. Uh, I'm really, I really want to see us a, a plant. I would like for CCDA people, and I would like for the good churches, the successful churches, do mission. They don't do mission so selfishly. Go into those apartment houses where there's six or eight hundred people living in those apartments and rent one of those apartments there and start uh, some Bible, some tutoring there, start some good news clubs there and bring the children there and bring their parents and start a house church there. And when that house church get to be about 50 or 60 people, uh, start another one. Now, these are in the target areas. These are in the hard areas. These people need nurture. They've been neglected, and they can't get that nurture in these huge churches. <laughs> Many of us can. Many of us can go there, and I can enjoy it. You can enjoy it. But these people, we need leadership from the neighborhoods. And that we can work with those young people there and put them in place of position. Because as the church gets bigger and gets more sophisticated, we can't use the people because we don't want to make no mistakes. And so we don't raise up leaders in our neighborhoods. We need now to begin to target churches in neighborhoods where people are at and, and build a system. Let, let them be the, the sister church to the big church. 
organize them in a way that they can still get the education and support and everything from the church, but, but also take an offering with them. I used to love my wife. We worked in, all we worked in the poverty program with the, in, the, in the poverty areas, in the poor areas, and with our child evangelism classes. But she would always take an offering. And those children, she would tell the missionary stories. And she would tell about a missionary in Africa, somewhere else. And she would take, and my wife would have these jars full of nickels and dime, and to get them together, and, and then take them to the bank and cash it and send those checks over. There. And those children love that. No, I don't like this, how we patronize the poor. We said the poor is too poor to give anything. That's the way you get from God. That's the way you get from God. It says, give, and it shall be given unto you. This woman in Elijah's day had just one little bit of oil. She gave that oil. She gave what she had, and God multiplied that. So don't go around patronizing the poor. Give the poor an opportunity to participate in obeying God and carrying this gospel to the world. And so we see a big God. That's, what, that's the first thing. We see a powerful God. We see a God that covers the earth. Covers the earth. That's the first point I want to make. Number two, when you see God, you see yourself. See yourself. When you, when you have a vision from God, uh, that's why you got to repent. That's why you can't even see the kingdom of God to repent. And, 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 and as you see the sinfulness of your sin, the morning that I accepted Jesus Christ into my life, I felt absolutely wretched. Wretched. I felt that God had put his arm that morning around a, a, a mechanic, and I was so greasy and dirty. But God's arms felt so good. He loved me. But I saw the depths of my sin. And for the next month, I was just confessing, confessing, as all those old sins would come before me. And those old sins would come before me, I would, they would feel so bad, so bad, so bad. And I would confess those sins to God. When you meet this holy God, uh, you are not adequate. I meet these people who are, who are uh, junior colleges drop out and they say, I'm overqualified. Well, you know how overqualified when you meet God. Uh, I got all of this to offer to God. Look where I am. Look what I got. It's wonderful that God found me. You don't, you don't, when you meet God, you see your absolutely inadequacy. You see that you are lost, but you see this loving God is reaching out to embrace you, to embrace you see yourself. Number three, when you meet this God, you get this vision from God, uh, you see the people around you. He says, woe is me first, I'm undone. Then he says, the people around me is undone, is undone. You, you get the best perspective. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way. We see sin as sinful. We see sin as sinful. That's number three. That's number three. Number four, let's watch him now as we experience what Christianity, what religion is all about. What was the center of Old Testament religion? Was the sacrifice, was the sacrifice They have your sins forgiven. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiving of sin. And let's look now. We get an altar scene. We get an altar scene here. God is fixing it now. Clean him up. He see himself as paralyzed. He see himself as sinful. He see himself as hopeless. And the world, his friends, can't do him no good. And now he got to turn only to this holy God. This holy God. Or better yet, God turns him to him. I like that better. God, look what it says here. Look what it said here. It said here. He said, uh, he said uh, my lips are unclean. My eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Verse 6 says, then flew one of the 
servants unto me. That, that lets us know also we can't save ourselves. This guy is laying there helpless. And when we see ourselves as helpless, God takes the initiative. God takes the initiative. It's not that we love God, but that God loved us. And that God reached out. If you're saved this morning and know Jesus Christ, it's because his loving God reached out and grabbed you and brought you into the kingdom. It's by grace. It's by grace you have been saved through faith. And that's not of yourself. That faith itself is a gift of God, not of your own works, lest anyone should boast. You are not good enough to get to God. God has to come to you. God has to come to you and embrace you. You can see this is by grace. That's why we ought to be living with gratitude. If you know Christ this morning, you ought to have a sense of gratitude to God that he reached out by his own will and pulled you in to his kingdom. Look what it says here. Then flew one of the serpents unto me, having a live coal, which he had taken with his hand from off the altar. And, and he laid it upon my mouth. And he said, lo, this has touched your lips. Your sin is forgiven. This is the important thing. You got to get your sin forgiven. You got to get your sin forgiven. You got to get sin Sin is what separates us from God. And when we come to know Jesus Christ as Savior, uh, he forgives our sin. He forgives our sin. He takes the initiative himself, and he forgives our sin. Look what he says. Said, Joe, he, uh, he touched my lips. Your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is purged. Now the person is ready. What is he ready for? Not just sins are gone. Jesus says, uh, unless a person is born again, they cannot see the kingdom of God. You can't do the will of God until God comes into your life. And if you see God's will through God's eyes. You see God's will through these converted eyes. Listen, listen now. Listen. Now, what he's been hearing, what Isaiah has been hearing here. It sounds. What Isaiah has been hearing is impressions. He's now fixing it. Hear the voice of God. Now, this is the most important point I want to make this morning. Because I get all these people walking to me all the time. You've heard that before. That says that everybody is telling me something about God's will and God's calling. And it more or less they have to do with themselves. Uh, God's calling on our life is not a calling to enrich us. To enrich us. God's calling on our life. I want you to hear the voice of God. This morning, I want you to hear the voice of God. God's voice is not that he's going to make you rich. God, that, and all of this stuff I'm hearing today about what God said is not what God said. It came out of our selfish desire. And we now is saying that God said it in order to convince you that I've been called in that. We need to be careful to listen to the will of God because this is something God is calling you to life, to give your life for. You're going to be effective. You're going to do something for God. And so you need to know that this is the voice of God. Let's listen. Let's listen. My next point is let's listen to the voice of God. I want you to hear the voice of God. I've already told you what God's voice is not, but I want you to hear what God says. And you go, this is consistent throughout the scripture. You can go right through the scripture and you're going to find this is consistent. Look what it says here now. And once the sin is purged, you ain't going to hear God's will until your sins are forgiven. You can't see the kingdom of God unless you are born again. And watch this now. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying. This is important. This is important. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying. I want y'all to listen for a few minutes. I really just listen. Just, just be quiet for a few minutes. 
quiet for a few minutes. Let's listen for the voice of God. Let's see can we hear the voice of God in your life. I also heard the voice of the Lord saying, Who shall I send and who will go for me? God is not calling you to yourself. God is not calling you to self. He is saying, who will go for me? Who will do my will? God calls us that his will might be done, that his kingdom would come on earth as it is in heaven. Who will go for me? Listen to the conversation when you hear people talk. Who is this for? Who is this for? Jesus did not come to do his own will, but the will of him that sent him. Who will go for me? God sees the children out there, dropping out of school, going to prison. He sees people dying for the lack of health care. He sees all of these payday loans into the community, taking advantage of the people. And we see people walking in ignorance, and Jesus wants to bring light to them. And Jesus is saying, who, who, who will go for me? 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 He's going to take care of me. God's going to take care of me. I like this verse in Romans where it says, what can separate me from the love of God? Can tribulation, can this death, can distress, the sickness and all that? He said, no, no, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor principality or anything can separate me from the love of God. God loves you. God loves you. You ain't got no business looking out for yourself. God is not calling you now to yourself. He's calling you and he's saying, who, who? Will go. It thrills me to think that I can do something for God. I still want to do something for God. I, I still want to do something for God. My, my, my wife gets on me sometimes. She, she called me the fix-it man. She said, you think you can fix everything. I can't fix everything, but I want to be concerned about a lot. I want to be concerned about a lot. I know what a leader is. I know what a leader is. A leader is a person to get other people to do what the leader won't do, and the people do it because they want to. That's a leader. What I'm trying to do is get other folks to do that stuff that I want done, you, you know, in society and encouraging people and in nurturing people. This morning, I had the greatest breakfast with some people. The breakfast wasn't much. It was my old series. But I'm telling you, these people. And here's, here, here's these people. Here's these people here at the, down there rescuing and had rescue these guys, just like the Hope House in Chicago, taking these men, these black men, and bringing them in, these drug addicts, and cleaning them up, and getting them jobs, and, and getting them back with their wives to take care of their children. Man, that was motivating to me. Another lady was with me in the breakfast this morning. I'm going to help them all I can. Remember, you got another burden. I'm going to help them all I can. <laughs> I'm gonna have a Another lady was there, and she's working with these kids who, who are in these, these little kids who are in these houses, don't have no mama, don't have no daddy, and nothing like that. She's working with them, and those kids need love, need love. That's what I want CC Day to be about. I want CC Day to be about reaching out there and using our resources and the church's resources to rescue the parishing and to care for the dying. I love Mother Teresa. I don't care what nobody says about her. I loved her. She loved the dying. She loved the dying. She loved the dying in society. And I love the people who are broken in the society. And we need a force in the world. That's what we want CCA to be. CCA don't want to be all the stuff that you want it to be. We really want CCA to be somewhat what God wanted it to be. We, we really somewhat wants to be the people who are trying to reach out to the most vulnerable people in our society. Those at the bottom. 
The rich will find us. The rich will find us. Let's reach out to the poor. Because the rich is looking for meaning and significance. Money don't do that. Money don't do that. So we need a force in the world that are concerned for the world. Let me get finished here. He experienced then. You experience. He's experienced the forgiving grace of God. And he hears the voice of God clearly. And the voice of God is saying, who will go by me? You know, that's consistent with the strip here. Uh, God is going up and down the streets. He's in the marketplace. And what is he saying? In the marketplace, he's saying, who will go for me? Uh, they, uh, lift up your eyes. Look on the field. They're white, ready for harvest. Pray to the Lord of the harvest that he might send forth workers into the field. Who will go for me? All you got to do, all you got to do is respond to that voice. Respond to that voice. That little old 15-year-old boy laying there in the temple, probably on his face. He's probably looking around him. And he's probably looking for the big shots. And all the people in the temple worship, he's probably looking for them waiting on them to, to hear that voice and to go up. And this little boy said something like this. Nobody else is going. And he says, uh, here am I. Here am I. Send me. And God took that little boy and made him into the greatest seal in the Old Testament. He was the greatest of all the prophets. He was the greatest of the seals. Because when Jesus came on earth, 